from Deep Within Our Hidden Volcano Laboratory, a podcast about gaming from the people who bring your games to life. These are your core elements. Core Elements, episode 74, recorded on January 6, 2016. I am Wes Wilson. I am Spencer Williams, and with us today, I am very excited. We are talking to Nina Freeman. Say hello, Nina. Hello. Nina, you have just recently gotten an incredible, um, I guess, is it an award? Do you qualify it as an award? Uh, the Forbes, Forbes 30 under 30 thing? Yes. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's an award. I don't know if it's an award, really. Technically, it's a list. Yeah, you got honorable put on a list. mentions, I would say. <laughs> you got uh, an accolade. An accolade? Is yeah, that... an accolade, yeah. Yeah, I think that's it. Because no one's really, like, winning anything, I don't think, or I haven't been informed of that. Uh, it just seems to be, like, a list of people that they thought were interesting, wanted to give shout-outs to. Um, and actually, yesterday, uh, Sybil, the game that I was a designer on that I'll probably be talking about the most on this podcast got nominated for Independent Games Festival Nuovo yesterday. So, yay, that's actually a nomination for an award. Um, so, two cool things in a week. <laughs> so, which is more exciting, the the, uh, the uh, EGDA or, or the Forbes thing? Uh, oh, it's not IGDA, it's IGF. Um, IGF, sorry, but, sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, IGDA is cool, too. <laughs> um, I don't know, I guess... IGF is probably more exciting to me personally, but I wouldn't want to like compare the two because they're both really awesome. Uh, but IGF is mostly exciting because I have been going to like that conference and show for so many years that I'm just like, yay, I can go again. It's fun. Um, but they're both really, really big honors. So I, I think about what what I would feel like, you know, if if I was in a position to be mentioned by Forbes, I would I would, and I'm not clearly, but if Forbes <laughs> did put me on a list, I would kind of feel like. Forbes? Really? <laughs> Forbes knows who I am? Really? Yeah. Maybe that's just yeah, me. I don't know <laughs> much about Forbes as an institution, so it was pretty surprising, but I am happy about it. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your game, um, Sibel, and, and yeah. why it's getting so much attention. Um, so Sybil is a game that I worked on as a designer and I was like the project lead uh, that we started like a year and a half ago. It came out on November 2nd of uh, 2015 and it's a game about um, a girl who has a relationship with a guy in an online game a la World of Warcraft or something and you know they play this game together and they they have this relationship uh, that is romantic and it's about how they end up deciding to meet up and have sex in real life um so it's like a game about their relationship and you play as the girl and sort of experience their relationship as it develops up until the point where they meet in person um for sex so um, it's on Steam. It's like a PC and Mac game. Um, Sybilgame.com is the site if people are interested in looking at like images and stuff of it. Um, it kind of consists of a, a number of different layers. So like you're on this girl's desktop for part of it because you're really playing as this girl as if you're sitting in her computer chair. So you're like going through her desktop as if you're her and you can play her online game and their FMV sequences to sort of show who these characters are as people. Um, so I think that pretty much sums up the core parts of it. But uh, you're also working with um, with another game company on uh, on another game. What are you working on with them? Yeah, so uh, I guess like some time ago now, I started working at Fulbright um, and they made Gone Home before. I didn't work on that. I started working with them after um, on this the current project, uh, current game called Tacoma. Um, and Tacoma is like a first person story driven exploration game about um, a space station called Tacoma. <laughs> um, so it, it has some things in common with Gone Home, obviously a very different setting. You're on a space station um, and there's this crew of six members um, and it's sort of about them. Um, and you, you explore the station and learn more about them and the story that unfolds there. So I've been working as a level designer on that project. Um, and that's Will what I'm doing it, right 
Light Gone Home be too atmospheric and scary for me to play? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I actually was pretty scared about, like, when I played Thank Gone Home for the first time, I was also scared. And you're definitely not alone. Like, I've heard a lot of people say that. So It freaked me uh, out so much yeah. I had to stop playing it. And I, I feel like I'm such a wuss. <laughs> it's yeah, I it's really that like home alone like in the dark during the rain feeling like it's just like <laughs> that's gonna creep out i think anyone basically <laughs> and it, it it banged on so many tropes like the, you felt playing it as a game that there were certain elements of it that were bound to happen and and it fed into the story you assuming things were going to go a particular way uh but yes at certain points of time i was like i don't want to do that i don't want to do this why would i go and do that <laughs> So, uh, yeah, we had Steve on the show. Uh, he, he's, yeah, that's cool. he's a he's a great guy, and I, I really enjoyed his game. And uh, I actually got to play. And and how many other people, b if before they've actually spoken to someone in person, have call it Sibel? Does that happen often? Uh, it's Sybil, <laughs> but it. I mean, I don't even know if that's the true pronunciation. Basically, like. I kind of stole that username from a girl I admired in middle school and high school because her AIM username had that in it. And I asked her how she pronounced it, and she said Sybil. So I've kind of just always stuck with that because um, <laughs> it's inspired by her. <laughs> but I got to play your game, and I, I found it really interesting. And it's it's intimate on a level that is that is almost uncomfortable. Um, and, and I think that's <laughs> part of the really amazing thing about it is, is that is that and when people when you try to describe it to people I, I think intimacy is the is the primary descriptor I use um, is that what you were going for with your game uh, yeah so my goals as a designer was my goal was to make a game that would support player character embodiment of this girl's experience um, so it's very much about like trying to sort of like play as someone who is maybe very different from yourself and sort of seeing things from their perspective and kind of getting to know them as like a character better um, through that sort of through the mechanics of the game as you're sort of performing as them um, so I think that that you know that is like an it's like you know getting to know someone is like an experience of intimacy um, I think often we use the term intimacy to talk about like sex or stuff like that which the game is certainly about but I think intimacy also applies um, really well to just like getting to know a character in in like a deeper way. Um, and with Sybil, I definitely was trying to like write, you know, characters that weren't one dimensional or tropey. Like they're based on real people. So <clears throat> like the girl's based on myself and the guy is based on a real person. Like this stuff all happened. So I tried to represent that experience honestly and like, you know, write very human characters rather than like shallow characters. So I think you know, when you as a player may get to know a complex character like that, like that can feel kind of intimate because you feel like you know them better and they're like people because they're complicated, which is what people are. Um, so I think, you know, that, those are my goals and that's kind of what I've seen some players experience, which is good. <laughs> I'm glad you felt like it was intimate. That's a good sign. <laughs> yeah, I, I and and it, I think it's really hard to capture that in games. And I want to talk a little bit more in depth about that later. Uh, but one of the things that I've also found really interesting, my friend Hillary played, and uh, she did not know what you looked like, and so she played the game, and then she went to your Twitter account. It was like, oh my god, and and uh, has you share a lot of pictures in the game that are obviously you and. A much younger age yeah. um how how is portraying you as a character um how how exposed does that make you feel to, to the people who are playing your game um i don't really think of it that way myself because like when i make these games i you know i take real stories but i I'm not treating it like autobiography. I'm not like, I want to tell my story. Like I separate myself from it and say, I want to tell this character's story. Um, Cause that thinking of it, thinking about the story and like separating it from myself like that helps me write better. I think personally, I'm sure other people have different approaches, but for me, like I kind of need to feel separate from the character to treat it like fiction almost in a way so that I can kind of like be as honest as possible about these characters rather than letting my own like, emotional bias or like anxieties kind of get in the way of writing 
honest characters that are interesting that have good and bad sides etc um so i don't really think of it as like i don't think of the character nina as like a me like i don't have like when people play it I, i'm not like oh now you know all the stuff about me like they do but it's also just the story that i authored um despite the fact that it's like true stuff um and yeah a lot of the pictures are definitely like from when i was younger that i like collected from old hard drives but like it's still like all about the character even though it's really my stuff um and that's just sort of like how i think about it for myself so i don't it doesn't really like give me any anxiety or anything like that um it's just part of like the craft of it and it's part of the the game so it's separate from myself and it's part of the experience that i have consented people to look at by putting it out into the world <laughs> see i had a i had a, a different experience and that's i i was familiar with you through uh kara ellison's journalism um prior to playing the game and um the very first feeling that i had when when you showed up on the screen was wow she has a really nice computer chair that yeah. was my very first thought because the very first shot is you sitting in your chair and i thought yeah i, I like that chair i need that chair <laughs> it's a it's an ikea chair so you can yeah you told me that on twitter <laughs> That's awesome. Well, um, we will talk a little bit more about your game and, uh, and, and how you've brought the things that you care about to life. But first... Lab Notes. So I'll start off some of the things that I've been playing. I'm, I'm actually, and I think I think Spencer is gonna is gonna share some of my shame. Uh, I picked Guild Wars Two up again, and over the Christmas holidays, uh, I, I was I was really digging into the grindy um, holiday uh, cheer uh, of the of the thing. I, I wanted to get the achievement. I spent a lot of time kind of zoning out watching some uh, Netflix and then uh, doing some Guild Wars 2 jumping puzzles over and over and over again. And, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've said before that MMOs can be a guilty pleasure at times and, and I still feel that way that sometimes when you're doing certain things in games, it feels... Uh, almost like you're you're doing something like paying, playing mumbly peg with your fingers over and over and over again just because it's it's a habit and you do it. Uh, but I did pick up a couple of other games. First off, I, I picked up Undertale um, during the Steam sale, and it has. You're, I, you're too old for Undertale. I'm, what? I'm telling you this. I'm telling you this because it's what the internet has decided. You are too old for Undertale. What? The I have... internet has decided that if you are over the age of like 22 max, you are officially too old for inter uh, for Undertale. I'm, I'm sorry, Wes, but you you can't what, play it. What possible justification can anyone have for this? I, I, because it's <laughs> it's it's like modeled after my generation's RPGs, and then additionally, like some of the humor is is has a definitively old slant to it. Um, but it is charming and it's clever and and uh, Will Overgard, who I've had on the show, told me I needed to do a pacifist run of it. So I'm doing the pacifist run and I can't help but laugh at some of the things that happen when you're doing the pacifist run. And uh, I'm really enjoying it so far. I'm, I'm about two hours in. I'm going to be interested to see where it goes. But so far, I can see that it deserves a lot of the hype. Um, although, God, I hate hitting enter over and over again going through freaking text scrolling oh my god um, I've been um, trying to play it on uh, on my steam link but uh, my PC is out of commission right now so I haven't been able to play it I am also too old for it internet so <laughs> well uh, I tried to use my steam controller uh, but I can't get it configured right. I got a Steam controller for Christmas, and I was so excited, and I've only been able to get it work with, like, a couple of games. I'm very frustrated. Don't they have... Con I would... I'm surprised that Undertale doesn't... It must have some configuration set up in Steam, because I know, like, either the developer or users can set those up. So. Yes. 
I, I imagine it they does. would have some there. It does. I'm just uh, evidently too old for my controller. Uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then the last thing is I, I was looking, so I was getting angry at myself for doing these other grindy things. I'm like, I need something to kind of zone out on a little bit. I, I did a lot of traveling over, over the holidays. And, and, and so I, when I got sat down to play games, I, I, I don't know, like I was looking for something a little more, a little more, Without, without a pace I needed to follow. Uh, so I picked back up Card Hunter, the Blue Man Shoe game, and uh, and we had we had them on the show before as well. And oh my gosh, I forgot how delightful that game can be. And I still think it's one of the best examples of the online card game slash board game. And it's it's free to play and you should pick it up and, and they, they started doing some modules within the game itself that are um based on like you play the you play monsters so you get all new cards that have nothing to do with what your characters are doing and it was a ball i got to play a rust monster and i got to play a mind flayer and i got to do you know and it was awesome so pick up card hunter try it out it's it's still good and and i those guys need to make a lot of money so what about you spencer let's hear about your shame uh, my shame is uh, Star Wars The Old Republic, which is um, old, and uh, no one liked it, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I don't know why. I, I decided to give it a shot when the new like little mini expansion came out, and I have been enjoying it. And, you know, I found a guild that I like, and that's really what you need. Are you role-playing? Of course I am. <laughs> yeah. My my um, Sith Guild is awesome. Thank you very much. <laughs> and our our little tavern nights where we go out and do Sithy things. Yes. What kind of Sithy things do you do? I want to hear. I want to hear. I want to hear. I, I I I'm not I'm not at liberty to divulge the secrets. You're not you're not of our tribe. <laughs> <sighs> um, it's a good time yeah. to be playing a Star Wars game because I know, um, I know. Except here's the thing: is I'm not actually a huge Star Wars fan. So um, <laughs> everyone in the guild is like taking off, you know, whenever Star Wars: the, the Force Awakens comes out, and they're going out to they're they're going out to watch it, and they're coming back to talk about it, and they're like, "Oh, we can't wait to talk about it!" And I'm like, "Really? How was it?" They're like, "You haven't seen it." And I'm like, no, no, how was it? They're like, we can't talk about it. We'll, we'll spoil it for you. I'm like, I don't care. Talk about yeah. it. What's I don't care about happen? spoilers There's, It's a uh, really good movie, though. Like, I saw it, and I'm not I, a huge Star Wars fan, fan myself. I like I like them, but it's just a good movie. It's just, I like, have good seen it now. film. Yeah, I yeah, it's really good. It. <laughs> and, um, and now I'm not the one that no one's talking. This is why I hate spoilers. No one will talk about anything because of spoilers. Everyone's like, no, we can't talk about it. Oh, no. but so everyone talks about it. And everybody talks in code. Like, you know, when the 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 guy uh, did the thing. No, uh, you mean you mean the guy who has the blaster? No, not that guy. The the the, the guy. Anyway, I could go on like this all day, and I won't. But anyway, yeah, I'm in. I'm I'm actually. Wes knows my history with MMOs, and I don't level well. I don't play a lot of characters very highly. I, I, I tend to lose interest. I'm actually starting to work on my third character. Really? Yep. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I, you've told me not to, but I kind of I kind of thought I might go in and finish the game I started with my character years ago. Um, it's not worth it. You tell me that, but then you spend so much time playing it, and I trust yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. How much time is your Guild Wars worth? Oh, it's a lot. I like it. No, it's not. It's not. <laughs> the other thing, and this was huge for me, was um, this was just this week. Amplitude came out, and um, back when I was in college, I played tons and tons and tons of Frequency and Amplitude, and I'm super, super excited, and um, I, I, I love it, and it makes me so happy, and. Yeah, that's it. That's all I'm playing. Nina, do you play anything, or do you are you like all other game designers, and you have no time to play games ever? I actually play a lot of games, uh, and I didn't used to like when I first started making games. I felt like I was too busy to play games, but as I've gotten more and more like 
as I've made more and more games, I find it really, for me, important to play a lot of games just to like keep myself thinking about stuff in different ways just to see what other people are doing. Um, so I have been playing uh, Xenoblade Chronicles X. On I the have game. that. Mm-hmm. I, I have it's not. really fun. And like I, I, I played it because I'm like a huge nostalgic fan of z- like the uh, Xeno Saga games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I just love that whole series, and so I was like, I really want to play this. Um, and but it's more of a, you know, it's not like Xeno Saga, like it's an open world type game, right. so it's very different. Um, and that normally I'm not like super into open world games, just not my style, but I've been enjoying it because like the aesthetic is really cool and like the quests are really cute and it's just been fun to like explore that world. I'm, I'm enjoying it a lot. I haven't gotten to the point where I can be in a mech yet. So I'm like, I just really want to do that. Um, so I'm working towards that. Um, and I also been playing this Otome game called Amnesia Memories, um, which is basically like a dating sim with a girl main character and a bunch of guys that she can date. Um, and that's a really, really good game. Um, the writing is really interesting and it's one of those games where you have like multiple paths and I tend to be the type that's like, I want to see all the paths. So I've been like dating all the boys in that game and seeing what happens. <laughs> and it's a really like very high production value, like beautiful, beautiful game. And the writing is pretty good. So I've been enjoying that a lot. You know, I almost picked that up. Um, but Super good. I have another Otomi game. Uh, called Sweet Fuse at Your Side that I haven't played yet, so I can't um, I can't get another one yet. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> you can put a lot of time into those things. Yeah. I, I bought the pigeon dating sim during the Steam sale. <laughs> it was it was I haven't no- actually played through all that yet. <laughs> I, 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 I wanna fall in love with some birds. Uh, that's gonna be my that's gonna be my dating sim. Uh, <laughs> I'm kind of I'm actually in a weird way looking forward to it, but I feel like I, I feel like if I better not put down Undertale because if I do, like I'm I'm in a bad place right now where if I put games down I don't finish them. I I put Taylor's Principle down and I'm angry at myself for it, uh, and I keep putting down Witcher Three and I'm getting angry because I want to I want to experience that game fully. Um, so anyway. You know, I did forget to mention Aviary Attorney, which is amazing. What is this? Tell me about this. Aviary Attorney is a game in which you are a hawk who is a lawyer. Um, I And it's amazing. You should look it up. It's on Steam. <laughs> okay, I'll do it. That's a deal. I, and, and then I have to have been doing what I've been. I picked my clicker games back up again. I know. I saw. Uh, I, I, I shouldn't. I shouldn't. But I picked him back up again. Anyway, so uh, yeah, let's uh, let's let's move on. Eureka! Ow! So for those who uh, have not listened to other shows that I've done lately, uh, I am actually uh, not living with my family currently. I am living in Atlanta. I'm working for the New York Stock Exchange. I've officially joined the man, and I am now promoting his evil ways. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I'm still doing a lot of the things that I've been doing, but I've been doing them with a full-time job at the same time. Still... It, it helps to have uh, some, some, some assistance, uh, especially with things like food and entertainment. Uh, this weekend is the Smite World Championships, and, uh, and I'm going to go and do a lot of the things that I used to do when I was uh, much more active in the YouTube and Internet community, uh, and I'm looking forward to it. But if you would like to support me, this show, the things that I'm doing, and all the stuff that's been going on, you can go to patreon.com slash Wes Wilson and chip in. I, I could certainly use it. Uh, a lot of the money that I've been getting has been going towards um, food and sometimes liquor. So, uh, so these are these are useful things that you can help me out with. Additionally, uh, go check out lootcrate.com slash Wes Wilson. I'm still doing videos with my kids. They're still having a lot of fun, uh, and you can still help support me and the show if you go to either of these sites. 
So let's talk a little bit about what was in the news. First off, I thought this was kind of amazing. Steam is estimated to have brought in $3 billion in revenue last year. Uh, and that's with $650 million of it coming just from its top 20 games. Um, and uh, I, I, I am a little astounded by that number. Um, but at the same time, I'm not because I still keep focusing on PC games. Um, the, the, the whole PC gaming is dead thing comes up every single year. And yet the numbers on Steve keep growing and growing. And they've passed the uh, most consecutive player milestone again and again and again. Although I imagine that since uh, some of these clicker games are so popular that uh, some, of those, some of those numbers are a little bit skewed. Um, and I've been hearing really good things about the indie games making it on Steam lately as well. How are you guys feeling about Steam as a platform and, and, and what it's doing for gaming? That was a very open-ended question. <laughs> Are you asking me? Sure, or? yes. Uh, I, yeah, well, so I guess the first game that I ever put on Steam was a free game called How Do You yeah. Do It? Um, so my team and I put that up, I don't know, like a year or two, maybe two years. I forget. Um, but that was free, and that was cool. It was interesting because we had first, it was a Global Game Jam game of three years ago or something, and we released it right after Global Game Jam, like the day it ended. And it kind of like, I don't know if I would say like viral, but it got like pretty popular pretty fast just on the internet. And it was interesting to see, like, we had that spike of publicity in the beginning, and then when we put it on Steam, like, a year later, we got another really big spike in publicity just because, like, Steam is so visible and it got featured on the front page and stuff like that. So it's interesting to see, like, how just being on the Steam front page can really, like, put your game on the map suddenly. Um, and that certainly did it for us for that game. And... You know, Sybil got featured a little bit and that helped a lot with Sybil. So, like, it's definitely, like, if anything, Steam is just an amazing, like, marketing tool in a sense. Like, it's good to sell your games on there, but, like, also it's just good for visibility. And that's been, like, my main, the main appeal of Steam for me is, like, that level of visibility. Because um, people really, like, look at what Steam has and what they feature and stuff like that. Um, so it's really good in that sense. Well, evidently there were over 3,000 new games put onto Steam last year. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> and that just blows my mind that, that people are able to get through it. But the strength of the platform seems to be making sure that there are winners. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that, that seems to be a pretty sweet thing. Um, now, Spencer, I know you've been doing a lot of console stuff lately. Um, has, your, has your PC gaming been kind of falling by the wayside at all? No, it's just... Um uh, it's not that my console gaming has has eaten into my PC gaming so much as I've been feeling guilty that my consoles aren't doing anything. So I've been making myself use them. But it, anyway, um, I don't I, I I don't get excited about stuff like how how many the the estimated sales of Steam really it it just doesn't do a whole lot for me. So I, I don't know that I I mean we we know Steam is successful because it's self-evidently successful. Because <laughs> we, we live on it. Yeah, not just because <laughs> we live on it, but because it's impossible to go anywhere in gaming without seeing its fingerprints, you know? Yeah. Um, these days, at least. Yeah. yeah. Five well, years ago, it's different. I, um, I, I, it, it just excites me to see... Uh, I don't know. I guess maybe I'm used to, as a person who has had bizarre interests his whole life, I'm used to the things that I become interested in not succeeding. The games that I really like fail. The you know the the books that I really want fail. And lately, I'm the target demographic. Like Steam's succeeding. Game of Thrones is on is one of the most successful things on TV. You know. Wow, you really desire serious validation from your corporate structures don't you no i'm i'm just I'm, I'm i'm basking in the joy of being the target market pardon me it's uh it's it's a it's a pleasant thing uh 
Well, so uh, I mentioned that I was going to the uh, Smite World Championships, and uh, as long as we're talking about revenue and how and other things that interest um, Spencer, uh, the uh, esports revenue is expected to reach half a billion dollars this year. And having been to the Smite World Championships and seen the excitement level that was there, and and the and the, the attention that this stuff gets online, this is also exciting to me as well. This is more, as you say, corporate validation for my interests. And and I feel like if the money keeps coming in, then the then the, the products will keep coming. And uh, and so I'm I'm really looking forward to going and seeing the people at the show this weekend. Um, have you been following any esports and is there anything that you're interested in? I'll start with you, Spencer. No. There's no esports that you're interested in at no, all? No, not at all. Not really? At all. It, it is... It is it, it, it's not... It, I, I, it's not that I don't understand it. It's that the... the it does not interest me at yeah. all. It just... It, it, the, the concept does nothing for me of sitting around and watching people play video games. <laughs> there's irony there. And how about you, Nina? No, no, there's not, because I never did a whole lot of Let's Play stuff because I never understood why anyone would ever want to let Let's Play me, you know? It yeah. just <laughs> What about you, Nina? Is, is, has any of the, the uh, eSports stuff gotten, in, gotten to you? Uh, yeah, I, um, I watch... Twitch and see a lot of that stuff. I'm not like super into a lot of the games that are the focus of esports, but I'm interested in that culture. And I guess the one I, uh, I've been interested in, like the in melee and like melee players, like Super Smash. Um, and like I always watch Evo, so I'm actually I feel like I'm actually more into fighting games than like other kinds of like esport type stuff. Um, and that has been kind of what I've been following, just like following fighting games people on Twitter and stuff and just seeing like what they have to say. Um, and I think that whole culture is really interesting. Um, and I like, I'm a big Twitch fan, so I watch Twitch pretty frequently. So I think I like seeing that kind of thing pop up. I think like any anything like that in games is always gonna be interesting to me, like all the different aspects of it. Um, just the fact that like games can be like a solitary experience or like a um, an audience experience, um, I think that that is kind of an interesting, two interesting things to look at. Um, especially as someone who's made like how do you do it tends to be very spectator friendly. This is a game I worked on before um, about a girl trying to figure out how sex works with her dolls, and I started thinking about spectatorship in games when we like started showing that at events because it tended to draw crowds, and I was it was interesting to see those dynamics. And I think esports also has that crowd dynamic, so I like seeing that, and I want to go to more events just to see like what that energy is like. Um, so I hope I want to go to Evo next year if I can, at least if not something else. Um, Evo would so. interest me a lot more than the Smite World Champ Championships, you know. It, uh, partially because the the game is more interesting to me than than those whatever we call them MOBAs. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I, think, I don't know much about MOBAs, so I have trouble watching them. But I still I follow a bunch of people that are really involved in that on Twitter, and I just try and like keep up on the news with it just to know what's going on, just because I like to be aware of everything. Um, but yeah, I also, I just don't know much about those games, so I, it's hard for me to follow them, but it's cool that people are so passionate about it. Well, um, hi -Rez actually put out a new cinematic trailer for Smite that's gorgeous. Um, I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, I, I really... I really kind of like it. it. You know, it's like how excited you got when you saw when, when when the first Blizzard trailers come out for new expansions and things like that. There's something about that um, the the level of detail being put into modern trailers that that can really take something that you're passionate about and, and bring it to life. And uh, I still love Smite. It's the MOBA I choose to play. Uh, I've tried out the new uh, high-res game Paladins a little bit, but it's still in beta. It's a little raw. Um, there's some good stuff there. We'll see how that goes. Um, so the last thing I thought we would talk about as far as news goes is there was evidently a new kind of... Um, Kind of kind of controversy, and that was that Undertale won best game ever uh, on a GameFAQs popularity poll. 
and uh, which I love. I love this fact. Yeah, and and uh, down with Zelda. Down with Zelda. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I, it's funny because like I, I'm all f I, I do have trouble believing that Undertale is the best game ever. Like it's good. I mean, see, I'm, I told you you were too old for it. But I told you. But I, I, uh, I actually, d I am not necessarily convinced that all the people that voted for it as the best game ever were convinced of it either. I, I think that. I, I think that there was a desire to promote something niche and and it worked and they won this popularity contest and it was kind of awesome and watching the the hair pulling and the and the and the fretting of those who didn't think it deserved the award there was a lot of good schadenfreude there um but uh you know, it, it it it's kind of, but I'm not. Again, I'm not convinced that the people who put that game in that position necessarily believe it's the best game e ever either. Who cares? Who just, cares? You just like it's this. A, I, I think Game Facts is hilarious, anyways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, but honestly, they have these they have these best character things on Game Facts every year, and it's always the same. You know, it's always the same Nintendo characters that make it to the top and. How, how cool is it that something completely out of the blue made it? I mean, regardless of whether it was legitimate or illegitimate, it, and you know, whatever that means. Yes. Um, well, uh, well, take up the status quo a little bit. Well, no, I'm all for that. I'm all for that, and and I I also you know I I will always enjoy the the gnashing of teeth from the people who who you know want quote unquote gamer games to be the things that always come out on top and and uh so it was enjoyable uh watching watching the with the schadenfreude was great uh but uh but anyway inspiration so nina i i i one of the things that uh one of the reasons why i think spencer was really really excited to get you on the show is that um is that he is a big advocate in portraying sexuality and sex in games and uh, seeing how um, and, and being frustrated that it's not represented in a, in a, in a more honest fashion. Um, and and I, I was really excited to get you on the show because I felt like um, nowadays sexuality presented in gaming has, has gotten more... Uh, acceptable and more honest and when you started working on your game like w was the sexuality of it the most important part or was it just one key element of this puzzle that you're putting together with your game uh for me like as a designer my first and foremost interest is telling a story um regardless of the topic um so my approach is always what is a story that's been sitting in my head that I find interesting, something that I feel like I can write clearly and honestly about? Um, and like, am I excited about that story? Would I want to ex like experience that story in a game myself? Um, and, you know, sex and sexuality co has come up frequently in the games that I've worked on as a designer. Um, and I, but I, I think that that that's just sort of like a theme I'm interested in looking at right now. And those stories are like just interesting to me because I think sexuality and like sexual development and stuff are really interesting to think about in terms of my own life and like culturally and stuff. Um, so I think it, it probably keeps coming up just because I think that that stuff is interesting. But for me, like I just want to tell stories that in game, I want to make games that help players embody characters. So I like, you know, I gravitate more towards stories that, that lend themselves to that kind of design. So the initial idea for Sybil, I found really compelling within that framework because, you know, it's about a girl who's at her computer playing an online game. Like sort of the, the mechanics that support that story seemed pretty natural to me. Um, and I, I kind of look for those stories where I can see clearly like the way in which I could design a game around that story that would help the player perform that character. Um, so, you know, the initial stuff isn't so much fueled by like, I want to make a game about sex as it is like, I want to make a story driven game. 
Um, but I also have this habit, like even before I was making games, when I was doing poetry stuff, like I tend to go through these like topical phases almost where like I start like thinking of all these stories that have to do with like one thing. So like, you know, right now with games, I've been making a lot of games about sex. Uh, back when I was doing poetry, like I went through a phase where I only wrote poems about parties that I went to. And uh, another phase where I was just focusing on like two of my best friends and like our shenanigans. So like I tend to go through these phases of like topics. Um, and I guess sex is like one of those topics for me right now. And I'll probably get sick of it or run out of stuff <laughs> to say eventually. Uh, but I haven't yet, so I guess that that's kind of the background on why uh, Sybil is about sex. It's just because that was an interesting story to me that had stuck with me since it had actually happened. I'm, I'm curious what's next. Like, um, the, I, I, I can think of several things that you could, you could work with, like maybe one like your favorite cd just several stories about your favorite cd I, I, mm -hmm. ignore me <laughs> <laughs> no, I know you mean. like i i definitely like kind of honing in on a topic i don't know why that's just always been a habit of mine like i'll get really into something like even just in my hobbies like you know when i was hi in high school it was like for a little while i'm like really into watching magical girl anime and i just do a lot of that all the time for a while like i've always been the kind of person that like gets really really into something for like some period of time and then like moves on to another thing to focus on. So I think that's also just like part of my personality. <laughs> just be honest about being a nerd. It's fine. Yeah. You're, you're in good company. <laughs> um, well, I, I, one of the things that I found most interesting playing the game was that like when you first start playing, it seems a little simple. And then, and then all of a sudden you start seeing some of the shades of, of what you're digging into. And that intimacy is almost uncomfortable, like like you're spying on someone. Um, there, there's there's a there's a voyeuristic aspect to it that that can that 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 almost made me say I shouldn't be doing this. Um, have has, have other people expressed that to you that 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 voyeuristic element is is both compelling and repelling about the experience? Yeah, I've had a lot of people definitely bring up like voyeurism as something that the game can sort of evoke uh, in for certain players. And, you know, I've thought about that a lot because obviously the game isn't about voyeurism. It's about performing as someone and part of performing as this girl is using her computer and like learning about her through her things, uh, like in a similar way to Gone Home, like Gone Home was a huge inspiration. So it's kind of like modeled after that kind of environmental storytelling stuff um and i think that the feeling of voyeurism in sybil specifically um which i don't hear people say that as much about games like her story which i find really interesting because that's another like desktop sort of simulator style game where you're going through files and stuff so i was like why is sybil particularly voyeuristic when i don't see people talking about some other games similar to it in that way and i think for sybil maybe um because you're looking at someone's desktop that looks very like it looks like a personal desktop like you might open someone's laptop like you would open my laptop and you're like you know it's my laptop because I have a cute girl background blah 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 um and it's got all these selfies and stuff on it and blog posts and and all that stuff that's like very personal and not as in personal to me but that kind of like to an onlooker no matter what kind of like blog post it was like seeing someone's private blog post is going to feel like a personal thing um, and I think as a culture, we have a lot of anxiety around looking at people's things, especially on computers and phones. Like, you know, we all have phone, like not, obviously we don't have iPhones, but people who have iPhones always have like locks on their phones, right? Like if you have a phone, it's often locked. Your computers are password protected, et cetera, to prevent people from looking at it. Um, so I think there's a lot of anxiety around like hiding your things on your computer and like not looking at other people's things. So I think the voyeurism and that anxiety about it comes from the fact that the game is about using your computer. And I think usually that feeling goes away for people once they start realizing they're playing as this girl and that thus that's their computer as the player. Because um, that's sort of what that's what it's meant to be. It's meant to be you're playing as this girl, so you obviously would have access to your own computer, right? Playing as the character. Um, so it's been interesting to see 
people react so strongly because of that like cultural anxiety around privacy and stuff. Um, but the game obviously is more about performing a character and thus by playing as the character that is your desktop. So there's no actual voyeurism going on despite any feelings of it. Because also, you know, even though there's pictures of me like selfies and like underwear pictures or whatever, I consented to put all that there just by releasing it. So there's nothing private that's being accessed in reality. You know, in the game, it's also not private. Well, it's private, but it's like you're the character's stuff. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. No, it absolutely does. <laughs> uh, and I found I found that some of your musical choices were also a little bit a little bit aggravating to to my sense of comfort. Um, I, I felt like some of the underlying tones that you use, like some of the some of the intimate scenes had this wah 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 wah, you know, going on with it, and it was almost like I felt like on edge. I'm like. So this is this is dangerous. This is something as bad as happening here, and and so it was it was it was a really interesting experience, and and I and I really enjoyed it. But I, I have to admit, like there were times where I'm like, oh, something. This is this is not good. I should not be right here at this moment in time. So yeah, uh, would you have felt the same way if she had been killing people instead of having sex? <laughs> I don't know. I, that's 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 a serious question. Yeah, no, no, and and I agree, and I, I think that like like part of it also, and and this is you know something that I. I I've jo I've mentioned before that betrayal of sex in games often feels juvenile and, and infantile. They, it's it's very difficult to take sexuality. Well, I mean, it's like, you know, I, I'm sure that Spencer's sexuality is incredibly interesting and complex, but for him to portray it to me as a friend, even outside of a game environment, it's all Sithy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it it would it would it would not have the complexity that it would have to him and the people he's intimate with. And and I feel like taking that intimate experience and portraying it in a game, and often in, in, in books and movies, it is difficult without reducing it. And and all that layered on top of each other created a, 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 a certain level of discomfort, I think. See, I, I feel think, like it's, go ahead. No, uh, just quickly, I think part of that is that often in media, sex is just a sex scene rather than a story about sex or a story that explores someone's sexuality. Like often in games, you know, you'll have like a Dragon Age style sex sequence where it's just sure. like, now you're having sex with this person, you know, and it's, it's just like about the fact that the act Yay, happened, dead -eyed man rather than talking about what that means or like where, how they got there. Um, and intimacy really, I think, evolves from like the whole process rather than just the act. So that's why for me, it was important that the game be about how they got there because that's really the interesting part. Um, and of course, the act of sex is interesting within itself, but that's not really what I was interested in exploring. Um, but often only the act is portrayed without any context, which I think is why it feels sort of like, I wouldn't call it juvenile personally, but like it just doesn't, it feels like a shallow like experience of it. Yes. Or and, depiction of it. I think one of the reasons that it's, that, that we, we um, accept violence more easily in games is because we are more comfortable with the tropes of violence than we are with the tropes of sexuality. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that there's a far more tropes of violence in our culture than there are tropes of sexuality. So if you want to have a meaningful discussion about sexuality, you do have to move outside of tropes. And that's one of the things that I do like about Sybil is that it, it does that. Um, and, you know, one of my things that I always say is, you know, you can't call gaming an art and then leave an entire aspect of the human condition outside of it and say, this is out of bounds. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why I want to see more of this in gaming. Not, you know, I'm, I'm stumbling over myself. Someone well, rescue me. Well, no, I, I, and I, I agree. Like, I, I would like to see, you know, when, when you think about sex in games, you think about really cheap stuff, usually. You think about, you know, you think about DOA style, you know, uh, 
volleyball games. You think about, you, you, you know, you think about uh, hookers. They just took the volleyball out eventually. Yeah. <laughs> you think about you think about hookers in Duke Nukem. You think about you know you think about hookers in in uh, Hitman. You you don't think about like actual human connections. You know, even even like games that try to develop some aspect of that you know you've got grand theft auto which throws these you know like crappy half-ass relationships at you um and then you've got you know the witcher 3 which builds some interesting like relationships but then sticks them in the sack with such speed and non nonsensical foreplay that you know you you're just like ah okay okay um, I'm all about some nonsensical foreplay myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think it's, it's interesting, like, bringing up sort of, like, the tri- AAA depictions of sex, because, like, I think, you know, obviously those are those are examples of it maybe being used in shallow. I don't, I'm not super familiar with a lot of... I haven't played a lot of these games that people often reference for sex in games. It's just kind of funny. Uh, they just tend to not be the kinds of games I play. But for me, like, I always think back to Final Fantasy X, which I think depicts, like, intimacy in a really good way. And that's like... Oh, especially you know, the laughing scene. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> pretty much. Um, so I think, I think often AAA developers don't get enough credit where it's due. Like, I think... You know, there's no actual sex in Final Fantasy X, but it's all about sort of like sexual tension, but it's unspoken of, even though it's shown. Like, it's shown rather than told, which is what I like about it. So I think that that's really good storytelling. Um, And so I think, you know, they're definitely good examples of intimacy and sexuality in games. It's just that often the most kind of egregious or shallow versions of it kind of float to the top and get talked about the most. Um, but for me as a designer, I'm like, oh yeah, like Final Fantasy X's huge inspiration, like show don't tell, like, or no, that's the wrong phrase. <laughs> show, show the intimacy through the game yeah. or through the gameplay or whatever, rather than say like they're having sex now, you know? Yeah. Um, right. So I look for that kind of thing and that's what I saw in that game. Um, and, and you know, besides- they're obviously games that do it well too so like it happens it's just that we don't talk about it as much um, besides in Final Fantasy X it would have taken them forever to undo all of those buckles I mean so <laughs> <laughs> well and and I think it kind of goes back uh, there was do you remember that old Red Letter Media review of the Phantom Menace uh, where he talked yeah. about how the lightsaber battles in the original original trilogy were reflections of the tensions that were going on between the characters and that the actual lightsaber battle wasn't the point it was resolving other conflicts in a in a graphical manner and i think that uh one of the things like i think with uh sybil the the sexuality is is part of is part of the tension between the people it's it's an expression of what's going on between the people not an act unto itself that should be you know lauded on its uh, uh, individually um and i yeah th- I, I th- it's more about the journey to get to sex rather than yeah. about which is why like we didn't show any actual like we didn't show like it's not there's no porn or anything in it. there's no like, actual <laughs> sex shown because it's not really about the act it's just about like the relationship um and sex happens to be a part of that so and happens to be a very important part of it so that's why and also it was really important because sex ultimately like you know sex as the act like has to do with bodies most often so that's why like in the end you see them meeting because like knowing that there are two bodies present is like really important to that story even more important than like actually showing them having sex like i think you kind of know what happens just by seeing them together like that yeah Yeah. it turns into a really weird episode of the guild (laughs) (laughs) i need to go back and rewatch that i just finished uh today's memoir and loved it so now i have to go rewatch the guild she's awesome (laughs) well i I also think that true character intimacy requires vulnerability that a lot of people don't necessarily want in their games like i think i i think that that um that when you get into deep into the human condition most of us have feel like we have these big open areas that people can get to but when we're when we're fantasizing and when we're externalizing our our pleasures we don't necessarily like 
having big giant open wounds or or sides that that can be easily hurt and and i think for real intimacy in characters and games they have to have vulnerabilities Mm -hmm. yeah i mean i just think interesting characters in general have some kind of vulnerability or flaw or whatever you want to call it um because i think you know the more perfect the character the less interesting they are to me because everyone knows that no one's perfect uh that sounds like kind of a stereotypical thing to say but like i think it's really important to remind oneself of that especially when writing especially for me like i'm making a lot of games and writing a lot of games that focus on myself so it would be really easy to like only talk about the good parts of me and to like make myself seem really cool but that's not the point like i'm not interested in writing that way because i want to write interesting characters that are honest and have and are complex and have different sides to them you know like a person there's always many layers um and not all of those are perfect or or pretty or amazing uh so i always try and like you know hone in on vulnerability and flaws and issues in addition to the good things just to make human feeling characters well, I mean, it's like uh, it, it, perfect characters are great for swinging from chandeliers and and <laughs> you know and 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 shooting arrows into people from a million miles away. But you know, like uh, you know, perfect that people. That is a long way. I have to say that <laughs> I'm not sure my computer can handle that clipping. But then you see something like The Last of Us, where like Joel is a very flawed character, and even though he's still an action hero, he's like a very interesting action hero because yeah, he's they kind of explore flawed. He's that. A mass that murderer. Yeah, and they and they, but he's not just that. Like he's a lot of different things, right? And they kind of explore that in that game. And I feel like that's a really good example of one of those like heavy action games that actually has like a really interesting action hero character that's not just one thing. Yeah, so it yeah. can be done. So um, wh when you have brought the things inside you out into your games like do you do you you mentioned that you don't want to make the the things that you create perfect but like are there things inside you that you want to put into your characters and polish them so it looks a little prettier so that other people like like for instance you know you talk about uh magical girl stuff you know and things like that like are there are there elements of you that you've put into your characters or into your games that that like you're like I'm gonna make that better I'm gonna make that more appealing because I want people to like that more uh the goal for me when I'm writing or like sort of choosing what to show in a game is clarity and context so I'm never like I want to make this thing seem better I'm more like how can I depict this specific aspect of the character in a clearer way like, how can I show, well, how can I, because, you know, a player comes into it and they don't know, like, they don't know the story, right? Like, maybe if they're my friend, they know, but, like, most of the players will have no context going in. So every decision I make as far as, like, what, like, in Sybil, like, what images I wanted to show, what the blog posts were, they were all, like, laser focused on providing context so that the player could understand the story and the character. Um, so I... I'm really, I don't like cruft. Like, I don't want things to be included in the game that aren't necessary and that don't support the story directly. So I'm very, like, uh, methodical about it. I tend to not get, like, very emotionally involved in this stuff. I'm just like, I really need to tell the story. Like, how can I tell it in the clearest way possible? Because um, if something's not clear, then the player isn't going to stick with the game and isn't going to find the story interesting. So I have to be, like, really focused on that kind of thing rather than thinking about like how to make something cooler because ultimately like making me look good or making something be cooler or whatever uh isn't going to help the story really i think like maybe in some scenario it would but definitely not in sybil <laughs> uh, so for me the focus is like clarity of and context and what do you feel like <clears throat> what do you feel put you in a position where you can kind of make those decisions is it your writing um like what kinds of things have have brought you to a place where you feel like you're able to create better characters mm -hmm. well i started out doing poetry and i think learned most of what i know about writing from doing that i studied under this poet charles north when i was an undergrad at pace university and he was really interested in the new york school and a lot of really interesting poets and <clears throat> he always urged us to write from our personal lives and you know showed us a lot of work 
of people who are writing about personal lives or ordinary lives more generally, just like writing about average everyday life. Um, so that was kind of what he was interested in, what he introduced to myself and my classmates. And I was really drawn to that kind of writing because I also think ordinary life is really interesting and beautiful. Um, so, you know, I when I was writing poetry, I got a lot of practice writing that kind of thing. And I've tried to like carry over a lot of the things that I learned from that time into games writing because I think for me more and more I realize that good writing is just good writing no matter what medium you're in um, so I I try to be open to using sort of like knowledge I, I gained from poetry in my games writing which I think has kind of made me like focus on that like honesty and clarity and context like those are all things that I carried over from poetry for sure well, okay. I, I think we're going to wind things down. I, I would love to, have you gotten any weird contacts lately from, from the 30 under 30 thing? Have, have, have you like been surprised <laughs> at any of the reactions that you've gotten? Um, nothing really that surprising. I mean, I'm still kind of in the like, uh, post Sybil release, like press media zone. So it's hard to tell what is, what comes from what, um, but I mean, I've been doing a lot of interviews and podcasts, so that seems good. <laughs> Nothing that like crazy though. Yeah, yeah. I just can I make a suggestion for for a game? I think you should sure. do <laughs> VR. How do you do it? Oh God, <laughs> yeah, that would be a thing. Uh, we actually have considered uh, doing it on iPhone or something. Emmett was working on that. Pretty much me. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. We're like pretty much, we're done with how do you do it. We did it in three days and we haven't worked on it since, but it might be fun to put it on iPhone or something. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe someday. I haven't done any VR work and like, I don't think I'll be doing any until it's a little more like the buried entry is a little lower. Yeah. It seems pretty um, high. We didn't talk about that. $600. Yeah. Wait, what? That's the that's the <laughs> price of the Oculus. Oh yeah, yeah. I uh yeah. Anyway, yeah. Moving yeah. On. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, let's uh, let's move on. Uh, uh, everybody should go to Steam and and uh, check out Sybil. It's a it's 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 a short game and it, it's very intimate and very cool and I recommend it. Uh, and uh, and Nina, we really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, I asked. Wait, it's, it's spelled C I B E L E. People never know how to spell it, so I like have to spell it out now every time. So that's how you spell it. Okay, but on. but it's funny because I asked you to come on the show and I was because you know I've, I've followed you on Twitter for a while and Spencer has uh, has has touted your virtues for quite a while and then you got the 30 under 30 thing and I'm like oh god I'm never gonna get her now <laughs> so I really I really appreciate you uh, coming on the show and and being our guest and talking to us I, I I was really excited about the idea of talking about intimacy and sexuality and games Games and and um, and I feel like you're the perfect guest for that, and I appreciate you joining us. Thank you. I enjoy talking about it. Thanks for having me on the show. No problem. And uh, I am I am back in gear, asking people to come on the show, and I, I'm 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 actually going to be pinging some of these other thirty under thirty people, seeing if they feel like doing the show. So we might have an interesting month ahead of us. In the meantime, um, everyone have a great weekend and uh, and take care. Bye-bye. Bye. You've been listening to Core Elements, exploring gaming one element at a time, a listener-supported podcast. See the show notes or get more information at coreelementsshow.com or leave us a voicemail at 256-763-0455.